off event. Cool. All right, anyway, um, when we go through um, Swift, one of the things which some people do say is, well, why is Swift there? What are, what's wrong with Objective-C? Why do we need to change it? And one of the things with um, Objective-C as a language is due to its sort of history and it's got a lot of legacy about it, it means that it has traditions and lots of coding which inf infers inefficiencies in your code. If you think back to the old days of Objective-C 1 and then Objective-C 2, you had to do things like getters and setters, you had to do things like properties, and then properties came along and you had to write synthesizers and then you didn't have to write synthesizers. So over the time the thing has changed and one of the things that Apple constantly comes up with is, you know, is the ideas of simplifying your code and getting rid of code really which isn't needed at all. Now, in terms of going through to do that, Swift, apart from having a very cool icon, and already I'm sold on it just from the icon itself, which is rather nice, it follows the complete mantra of Apple, which is common things are easy and uncommon things are possible. And due to the sort of the traditions of Objective-C, I think they've decided that they got to the extent of whereby they couldn't simplify the language anymore without doing a major restructuring of everything and if you're going to do that then why inherit all of the traditions why not go for something completely new and so that's what they've sort of done so Swift is that very thing and it really does follow the idea of reducing less code and it's also quite cool to note that it is a bit of a thieving language because all your favorite bits from almost everywhere including things like JavaScript and Python and all over the place have actually been sort of collected together and put into Swift. So it really does sort of cherry pick. And you'll recognize, depending on, of course, the languages you use, various ideas from all languages sort of all over the place. Now, one of the other things which is rather cool, apart from a new language, is we've got some new toys in Xcode itself, um, which will guarantee to have you pulling your hairs out with frustration to begin with. Um, uh, does anybody remember the transition to constraints? Yeah, how confusing that is. And still to this day, I've, every now and again, will think that's going to be easy. And after 40 minutes of fighting constraints, I think actually it wasn't that easy. But one of the things that's promising to either make things more confusing or easier is a new universal storyboard, which is basically called size classes. And it's a new system whereby one design does fit all. And we can now specify whether parameters are installed or uninstalled for different user interfaces and different sizes. So we just make one storyboard now, which is this universally abstract square. Design your user interface for it. And then you've got the abilities of summoning up all of these sort of little intricate things. Um, they're called size classes. And they allow you to specify exactly where and what size it is, and actually you do get more size previews as you're designing it, which would be more iPhone size or more portrait size, etc. But interestingly, the one thing which I think is a bit odd is they, for some reason, don't allow you to differentiate between iPads and portrait or landscape, which does take a little bit of code still, but they do allow you to differentiate between most of the views. Now, in terms of other things as well, Xcode 6 also has these new live views, which is quite fun, and live views will promise to give you the ability to code and if you write any drawing code at all, the, the bind of it was you had to keep running your code to see how it looks. And these new live views are quite cool, so I'm going to show you how to do one today. And when you do some coding with it, it actually runs in real time. So literally, as you're writing code, if you're in the split view with your storyboard side by side, you see instant updates of what your drawing code looks like, which is quite good. And of course, Xcode 6 as well also has playgrounds, and playgrounds as well are quite exciting ways to be experimental with Swift. And again, a bit like the live views in the storyboard, they allow you to write code in real time that executes in real time, and you get a very visual output you can explore of what actually happens from just writing in a very simple little function, and you get like a graphical overview of it, like so, which is quite neat, to actually, if you're doing any of Gra Apple's new graphical stuff, like SceneKit, etc., then you do actually get a rather nice real-time um, running of the animation and graphics and you've got like a little scrubber at the bottom just like in video where you can scrub through the time to see how your animations and your effects will change. I'd love to show you that but sadly I can't because um, my computer is running Mavericks and you can't play with this until you're on Yosemite so I'm waiting for the fall before that comes out whenever it's going to be released. But um, yeah so that's a sort of few things there that you can play around with which are inside. Now Apple has released Swift and they've given a few resources and I strongly recommend you look at them if you haven't already done so. There's an EPUB you can get for free called Swift that will allow you to study it and get to the details of it and also if you go to the developer portal um, from developer.apple.com they've got three very good videos introducing Swift, 
intermediate swift and advanced swift and again I would recommend watching those if you don't have time of course to do academy classes 3D swift which is coming up um, and that will be a really really good way definitely watch the videos and don't just read because actually there are some what I think are errors in the book which contradict directly what the developers teach in the videos so do watch out for that because um, I noticed that myself when I was going through some things now um, I'm going to just very quickly try to give you some basic understanding of the language itself. And I have to apologize a little bit for the quality of these slides because this morning I had a dreadful spinning beach ball when I opened up the presentation to run it and it wouldn't open so I've had to redo this in the last couple of hours. So um, apologies for the quality of it. But anyway, Swift. Now when we get started with Swift, Swift basically tries to take code that you know very well and abstract it to be as little as possible. So actually, this is a Swift program that does exactly the same thing as that. It tries to get rid of everything you don't need. So basically, you just keep the nuts and the bolts. It even has got rid, rather controversially, of the semicolons at the end of the lines of code. Not that you're not allowed to do them. They're still there if you want to put multiple commands on one line. But a bit like JavaScript, they're sort of optional. And they're things that you can opt out to altogether, if you like, because Swift uses the return keys like a terminator to mark the end of the actual lines. Now Swift borrows very heavily from programming languages like JavaScript and other scripting languages but keeps the rigid object oriented and data type control that you used to with Objective-C and even other things of Objective-C as well like the way you call functions some of that has also been preserved even though they've totally dropped the square bracket syntax and gone over to dot syntax for almost every call and that's quite good for some people because it makes you more familiar with the language from other programming languages but if you got used to and you love the square brackets I hate to break the news that in Swift they're sadly gone and demised so when you're designing Swift making variables very simple, you just use the var command and then you can data type using a colon and put in your basic data type. Likewise, you can also set a variable instantly if you wish. And let is what you would use if you wish to make a constant. Now one of the things that Apple says is you really should try to use let as much as possible because let is immutable, it's more efficient on memory and it is slightly better to use, and it should be used any time you get a value that you know at runtime isn't going to alter. But for everything else at runtime that will alter, you should use the var command, and that will then be treated as a variable rather than as a constant. Now, you can then create all of your other data types in any way you like, but one of the neat things about Swift is data typing is actually implied. So what it means is, when you're actually creating the language, those three lines of code language name, version, and introduced, that is exactly the same as that, but the data types are implied. So Swift will work out the data types for you based on what is actually going in, and then that variable is strictly typed as a string, a double, and an int. So you'd still get a compile time error if you tried putting a string into, for example, version, etc. But you don't need to declare the data types manually. So it will automatically infer any data types at compile time based on the types of data that you put in. Now, um, you also as well, apparently, and I do apologize, my version of Xcode is, um, um, Keynote is being a bit buggy and sometimes it's doing a bit of odd things, hence without a crashing this morning. You also as well, because it supports full Unicode, you can actually use Unicode characters like pi and emoticons and those little icons, although nobody's explained how the hell you're supposed to type that in as you're doing your development, but it is possible to use any Unicode character that you like in your code as a variable name. And as an example, if you watch any of Apple's demos, they can't wait to roll out the little laughing dog as a variable, which you can then use and store any values in. So declaring variables is quite straightforward, and in terms of data types, we have strings, doubles, ints, and bools on a base level. And floats don't really exist too much anymore in Swift. There is just doubles that's used for both floats and there. We have true, false, and nil. And nil is a little different to the representation of nil in Objective-C. I'm not going to really get into how and why it's different, but it is a little different to how it is in Objective-C. And we've also got arrays and dictionaries, although we don't have sets. Okay. Now, we've also got, as well, some very confusing things, but they're very useful once you get the hang of them, and that is optionals and tuples. And again, I'll explain about those a little bit later on. But tuples are very interesting because now, when you return data and information, 
you might probably be used to the fact that every time you wanted to return more than one piece of data, you had to construct something like a structure or you had to make a model so you could return several values, whereas now in Swift, you can return as many values as you want in one return without the need for building a data object or a dictionary or anything, and they're called tuples. And when you pull out the values and receive them, you literally can just access them in a really simple notation. And again, they're really, really very cool. I'm not really going to go into tuples today, but they're a great thing to look at to see because they group values together. And again, with less code, you don't need to build models or data objects. They allow you to do that. As well as, of course, you've got everything else you're used to from Foundation and Coco. So if you do love NS sets, they're still there, as are all of the other types. But what you get automatically is a direct crossover to the Swift data types. So whenever you are dealing with NS strings or NS dictionaries or NS arrays, they're automatically cast into Swift strings, Swift dictionaries, and Swift arrays. And this, those items have got all the same properties and methods that NS string has. So if I was to have a string and then do a dot, I'd come up with all the same properties and methods that I'm used to with NS string. And if I was to actually say string, the class, and do a dot, I'd get all the same class methods for instantiating values from URLs, variables, and all those other things. Now, in terms of mutability, um, whether strings are mutable and arrays, etc., Swift has a really unique approach. Of course, if you make the variable a constant, it's immutable anyway. But if you declare it as a variable, it is immutable until you change it. So automatically, without having to second guess whether I will need an array or a mutable array or a string or a mutable string, if I run any method at all that mutates it, then while it's compiling it's Swift, the compiler will pick that up and automatically declare the object as mutable for you. So therefore, again, it makes it a lot more efficient. You don't have to manually do that. Or sometimes people use mutable objects because they weren't sure what they would need, whereas Swift will work it out for you and keep it as tight on memory as possible. Now, the one thing that has to happen quite a lot in Swift is the process of casting. Um, and I found it's a little bit more so than what you had to do traditionally inside of Objective-C. So when you sort of do casting and things, you will be basically going through and casting your data a little bit more. And those are the two grammatical ways that you cast data, depending on how you'd like to do it, either with the as or with actually an instantiation method. Now, the other thing as well with arrays and with dictionaries, you create an array with simple JavaScript-style notation, and you create a dictionary with similar JavaScript style notation. All the little gotcha is it's with square brackets rather than curly brackets. That would probably be your instinct. And when you're accessing values out of those, very similar to the way we do it in JavaScript and a little bit of associative arrays in PHP, whereby it's all done with square brackets and with that. So no longer do you need to say dot get object at index, although that method is still there, should you wish to be old fashioned. You can just on your NS array or NS dictionary use that notation instead to pull out the values, which again will keep your code simple and make it a lot neater. And should you wish to mutate it, then very simple concatenation is the same as running the method add object, and that will allow you to add an object to it. And likewise, if you want to mutate or alter a dictionary, then again, you can do that, and it will automatically be cast as a mutable version should you do any changes. And incidentally, that's also the same grammar you would use if you want to mutate a string. So you can just do that. Whereas if you just say my string equals, you're swapping one instance of a string for another instance. Whereas if you say plus equals, you're mutating a string. So that would then add to your existing string object. Now, one thing which is different is the fact that in Swift, dictionaries and arrays are typed. So whereas in Objective-C, you never knew what was in there, in Swift, they are actually typed. So if I make a dictionary of strings, all values have to be strings. And now dictionaries and arrays can store actual numbers. So now you can put your literal variables inside, which is quite neat. Okay. Now, moving on, messaging in Swift. We all know the good old Objective-C ways of using the square brackets. And in Swift, there are a number of options as to how you send messages, but basically it's based on dot syntax, and it can still have the Objective-C style declarations of what the values are for. But this is one annoying horror I'm going to have to reveal to you. Xcode at the moment in beta is no longer aligning the semicolons. And I'm sure that will come in the lift, because I think there'll be a riot on if they don't sort that out. But um, I'm not too sure exactly whether the grammar of Swift is inferring that you have those left aligned or whatever. But at the moment, the compiler doesn't align those there. But I think it's rather neat to. So I'm forcing the habit. Now, other things as well. If you call any methods, as you can see, then of course if the method returns any values, don't forget to catch them with lets because they will be a constant and the values 
won't change. And if you declare your values and you want to print them out into a string, you no longer need to use format specifiers. You literally can write them out in a sort of PHP style way, using this grammar of putting them inside a parentheses escaped with an escape character. Or, if you want to be more JavaScript, um, you can, as you can see, add in the details like so. Now, in terms of control logic, um, ifs and dos, whiles, and fors are all pretty much the same as what you know and used to, but the extra grammar of the parentheses has been taken away, so you don't need to put it into parentheses. You can if you want, it's just it's not needed. And again, the idea is it just reduces the amount of code that you would like to write. And switches and cases are very different in one respect. Um, what do you notice is lacking in that little example of a switch in case? Break. That's right. Break is implied as a default in Swift. So you no longer need to write break unless you want to prematurely exit out of a control logic. Break is now automatic. In fact, what you actually have to do is to state fall through on the occasion when you do want to fall through to the next case. You have to state that instead. And that should iron out all sorts of bugs, because how many of you have been trapped with a bug whereby you accidentally forgot a break, and then it's fell through unintentionally? So the idea now is, because very rarely do you ever want it to fall through, it's now the default. It doesn't fall through, and you have the state you want it to fall through. But break still works, but that's used now for premature cutting out. And you probably can see the notation as well, if you want one case to be for multiple values, it can now be a comma-separated list. And it is even possible to use Swift's new range values as well, so I could easily say a case is from range 1 to 1,000. So again, without doing anything, in fact, there's a few little examples of Swift's range values. So again, that will reduce the code quite a lot. But one rule, there always has to be a default. If you don't put a default in your switching case, there will be a compile time error, so it always has to have a default action for safety reasons. Okay. Because I'm very lazy and often I don't put them in because I think, oh, well, it's not really needed. But if you do that in Swift, you get told off. So you've got to have some sort of default, even if it's not really doing anything. Now, loops are the same as forever, again, without the brackets. But you've now, with the new range selectors, you can now use this in command and you can give a range. So therefore, that's the same as doing the code on the left. And I think you'll agree it's a lot simpler and it's a lot neater. Likewise, you've got, as you're probably very familiar with Objective-C anyway, the ability to step through. And also, as well, you can step through from one and then use a variable or an array, and it would count through automatically to the number. So if you wanted to get like an index number of an array, if I said from zero dot 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 to the array, it would automatically count through and give you a number of the records as well. So the range selectors are quite cool. And even as well, you get the same effect with strings. Should you wish to go through a character at a time, the for loop can even enumerate over a string. So for loops, again, are very powerful things and quite cool in the way that you can go through these. Now, optionals are perhaps the most confusing thing, and they're the things that will make you hurt yourselves when you first start trying Swift, because people don't quite get how optionals are to be used. Now, in Objective-C, we had a lovely system, but it was an absolute bugger if it went down and you fall on the bad side of it, and that was the fact that all properties in Objective-C were nil, and if you send a message to nil, you get silent failure. And that's really cool because it means that when you want code to be optional, you don't need to write anything. You can just call it and you'll get silent failure. But of course, should you get on the wrong side of that, then silent failure means very hard to detect bugs. And how many times have you had to roll out zombies to go through and try to find the bad calls that we have got? So that is not at all how it works in Swift. So in Swift, the following is there. All properties that are optional will default to nil and all other variables have to have a value. So you know, therefore, that if a variable is marked as optional, it then may or may not have a value. But if it does, then it will have a value at runtime. And that's one of the things which is sort of enforced by the compiler. So what it means is never ever will it be possible to send a message to an object and get silent failure in Swift. It just can't happen. Now, unless it's marked as an optional, it has to have a value. So when you declare all your properties, you therefore need to choose what values are optional, and that means therefore the value will be nil until it's set, and you therefore will need to test that optional to see if it's good to go. And we mark all optionals with a question mark, so they stand out like a sore thumb when you're looking at your class files. So the way it works is a bit like this. 
I would declare my variable, and when you're using an optional, it has to be a variable, it can't be a let, because it has to be able to change at runtime between having a value and being nil. So when you do that, that value is going to automatically start off as being nil until it contains a value, but interestingly, when you call my optional, the variable, you are not going to get a value, you are going to get true or false. So all optionals are identical to true or false, you never ever get a value out of an optional. Does that make sense? So they're basically like a box, and they tell you a label as to whether there is something in the box or not. And if you want the value, you have to unwrap it out of that actual box. So that's the thing that a lot of people just don't get when they first start playing, and they try to use optionals just like values, and then they get all sorts of weird things going on because they don't realize the data type they're mucking around with is actually true or false. It's not the value they were expecting. So the way you would do it is you would test to see if your optional exists, and then the exclamation mark forces the unwrapping of the box because you know there's a value. And if you were to do that without testing, which incidentally you can do, the danger is if it didn't have a value, you would crash because it will therefore not be able to deal with that. So you look for an optional, and if there's a value in there, it will. you can pull it out with the exclamation mark. And, of course, the optional will get the value, and that would clear it, so then it would go back to being true for the first case and then false when I set it back to nil. Does that make sense? Now, if you want to, you can do what's called chained unwrapping, and if you need to delve into several optionals nested deep, it would be a real pain if you had to do it in the first manner. So in the second manner instead, you can chain optionals by asking a question mark, and then it behaves very like nil in Objective-C, whereby you'll get silent failure as you drill through should the values not exist, and of course, the value will return true when you get to the very end. Does that make sense? So that's what we'll drill through. Now, the best way to deal with optionals is to use this grammar, and this is recommended for how you should always handle optionals. You can test and set the optional all in line with an if. So you would say if, and there's a let, of course, because the optional value won't change, whatever value you want, give it a variable name, and then you do it in there, and that will automatically see if the value exists and unwrap it and place it into the variable which I've marked here as val. Can you see that? And then it will run that first statement so I can then make my value do something. But if it doesn't exist, if I want to, I can catch it with an else and deal with what happens when there isn't an actual value there. Does that make sense? So therefore, that's the best way, and that's the way I always would treat and deal with um, Swift objects for the simple reason that you want to make sure they exist first before you try doing any form of unwrapping. Now, functions are the same as you normally would expect. You declare them using the keyword func, and the return type is a bit odd. It's a little hyphen with um, a little angle bracket at the very end, and then you state the data type of what your function returns. And when you're receiving values in a function, you just put in your values and then see what property they are and see whether <coughs> they're conditional or not, or optional, I should say. And um, as you go through that, you may also as well declare those little labels. They're called named values. And when you place those in, that means when I'm calling it, those functions would actually have the value, the names start and end as the little prefix to those variable names. Although there is also another grammar as well, which is a bit weird, and that is if you use a hash instead, then what it means is it will automatically use the name of the variable as an actual label. And then inside of your method, you'd have the variable start and end, whereas up here, it would use start and end as the labels, and you'd have val a and val b. So let me just show you what that would look like when you call it, and then that should explain what you're probably wondering about. So as you can see, for both of those examples, when I call them, can you see that? They would use start and end as their little identifiers, their names, and then your value would follow it. And in the very first example, of course, 30 would be inside of val a, and 99 would be inside of val b. And in the second example, they would be contained inside a variable start and end. Can you see that? Of course, if I hadn't put those identifiers in, then when I type them in, my code would just look like that. So you can also do it like that. And those names, the variable names, will appear in the bubbles while you're typing it in. But if you actually want to have those little named identifiers, which are very useful for code reference, then you literally just type them in before the variables, or you prefix your variable name with a hash. And that means use my variable name as an identifier. 
So that's how functions work. Now, I'm going through this at lightning speed, so I'm hoping you're not getting too much internal bleeding with all this, um, just because there's only an hour, and I'd like to cover almost everything with you. <laughs> um, now, the other types of things as well is we've got enumerators, structures, classes, and closures. And closures is something new. You know them already as blocks in Objective-C, and they're a bit like lambdas in closures in other languages. And it basically means you can now just give uh, the curly braces and that will capture, like a block, the local scope where you run it, and it can be passed around as a variable and by reference, and allow you, in the same way that a block would, to run code asynchronously. And that's one of the big things with Swift is a lot of it runs asynchronously rather than inline like Objective-C does. Now, the other thing as well is enumerators, structures, and classes have had a massive facelift in Swift. They're almost the same thing. Um, enumerators can now have methods, and structures can now have methods as well as properties. And classes, of course, have always had methods and properties. So what it means now is enumerators, as well as containing the value, can actually have methods to process that value. So do, how many times did you have to write a switching case to convert an enumerator into a string? Whereas now you can build a method on your enumerator, uh, you can't talk anymore, on your enumerator and say to string. And that method will automatically switch itself and print it out. So when you're coding, you just can need to say my enumerator dot to string or whatever, and that will then run that method. So enumerators can have methods. And in fact, classes and structures are almost identical in Swift with one big difference. Structures cannot be subclassed. And also, structures are passed by copied memory, whereas classes are passed by reference. Okay? So that means when you pass a structure around, it's very like you're passing any variable around. It will copy its values, whereas when you pass objects around, of course, you are passing a reference, not an actual value. But structures are much more lightweight than classes, and therefore more optimal to use when you do not need that extra level that classes actually will give you. So here's a few very quick little examples. You declare structures and classes in that particular way. And I'm not too sure how I feel about that, but Swift has got rid of the header file, because when you get used to that, I really like header files as a way of cleaning up your code and giving you that philosopher's stone upon which to ponder about what's going on inside your code. But Swift, it's very like other languages, just one file, with, and you've got to drill through things to see what's in there. But you see, therefore, you would declare your variables in the very same way, say what was optional, and... Um, one last thing just about that, you can also declare your variables inline, but if you're declaring them inline, you cannot use any variables as references. If you have to put values in, you couldn't use one of your properties, because at that stage they don't exist. Okay? You also, as well, can add functions to your class using exactly the same grammar as normal functions. And when you're setting things up, the initializer is very simply called init. And you can overload functions in Swift. So you can give multiple variations of the init function with multiple different types of data and named identifiers, which is rather neat. And if you need to, you override functions by marking the keyword override, and then you can call superclass methods with the word super. Okay. So therefore, when you're developing your code, you can put them. But there's one little thing. This example, because I run out of time, I couldn't handcraft everything. This is literally just screenshots from the actual guide to Swift. And here's a mistake. Can you see the init method, super.init is first? Now, according to Apple's lecture on memory management, if you wash it, uh, wash it or watch it even, um, they state that actually super.init should always be called as the last thing you do in the initializer, not the first thing, because you want to make sure all your parameters are set up before you pass on to any superclass methods. So that's a little thing that I thought was interesting, which is in their books. I don't know if they came to that thinking after they published the book or not, but it certainly contradicts a lot, something of what they've said in their Swift lectures online. Now, other things as well is lazy loaders are even easier. You just declare the variable as lazy, with the prefix at lazy, and it won't load itself unless it's needed. So therefore, if it never gets used, it will stay as nil and will not get instantiated. And if you use it, it will declare itself. And another thing which is rather cool is if you want to write getters and setters, then you just open up your variable with the set curly braces, and you can write any code in there you wish, whereby you can mark with get and set to write getters and setters using that nice, simple little grammar. 
You also, as well, can write observers using that grammar. So again, you just open up your variable, and next to your getters and setters, well, of course, if you've got getters and setters, you won't need these. But if you don't use getters and setters, then will set and did set will run before and after any values will get changed. And um, what's also cool as well is, um, actually just going back to that, because I don't, didn't have a chance to grab an example, if I actually just opened that variable with a set of braces and had nothing inside, I could write what's known as a computed value, whereby there isn't necessarily a variable behind it. That value literally is calculated on demand and is treated like a property, but is actually calculated every time you run it. And closures can also be given in this place, but if you're going to do it, if you know the self-executing functions of JavaScript, if you use closure, make sure you have an empty set of parentheses at the end to run it, and then that means a closure could be used to instantiate a value if you wish, rather than it being computed, which means it would then have a value that would be stored. So there's a lot of scope when you're dealing with Swift variables with getters and setters and observers and other things. And of course you can still have variables uh, for class objects and class methods. Inside of classes, um, class methods and class functions are prefixed with class, and inside of structures, they're prefixed with static. Why they've got that as a different one, I'm not too sure, but they just do. Well, I guess because a structure isn't a class, it would be confusing if you said the word class. And as you go through here, here's a very quick little example of an enumerator. Can you see? So you can declare an enumerator, and you just need to put case with a comma separated list of all the possibilities, and then, as you can see, there's a function which is declared as a mutating function, meaning it will change, when you run that, the actual value of the structure. And as you can see, when you run it, you can therefore set up what the structure should be and then just call the next method to pencil it on. So you can see already with a glimpse of that, the power that enumerators can have when you work with them. They can really handle a lot of the code inside of themselves, reducing the amount of code you need to have in your classes for processing them. Okay, so this is a little taste of a few details of the actual language itself. Now, in terms of memory management, when you set up a variable and you declare it, if I then pass on the reference to another object, that will also have what we call a double retain there on the actual object. And, of course, if I flush any of the values, it will then release the object. And if the object becomes zero referenced, it actually is deallocated, and that's what deallocation looks like. That was videoed using a real object. And when you are working with that, it's of course the system you already love and know is Arc. So Swift is using Arc. And um, it's important to make sure that you know just a few of the fundamental basics. Now, one of the things that can happen quite a lot in your code, especially when you're dealing with model classes, is double reference data, whereby you can have two objects and their data refers to each other as a sort of a cross-reference. So in Swift, Using Arc, it's the same as what used in Objective-C, but there's one new thing that's been added. When you've got your classes, you've got the strong reference, whereby this object and that object both own each other. Then you've got other things, whereby you've got a weak reference, so one object is the owner, and the other one is just a referencing. But in Swift, we have this um, sort of new reference called unowned references, and that's whereby they are a hybrid between weak and strong. So I'll give you a quick idea as to what's going on here. So those little green dots are just representing that at the moment all those objects are referenced in your code. Now with the very first example, because they're both strong references, if I were to flush the first reference, then there will be no deallocation because the model is referring to it. And if I flush the model's reference, there'll be no deallocation because the instance of my class is referring to it. Does that make sense? So therefore I would have a leak because there's no way they can be released and deallocated because there is still a valid reference in existence. Whereby in the second method, if I release my class, then um, what you will see is it will immediately deallocate. Can you see that? Because the reference backwards from the model is weak. And if I was to do it the other way around, whereby the model was unreferenced, it hasn't been deallocated because it's still being referenced by my class, but when my class is unreferenced, they will both deallocate. Does that make sense? Now, there's sometimes a case whereby this model may exist, and in order for it to function, it needs to have a valid reference to this. And of course, as you've already seen, if this was being referenced by somewhere else, and it's got a weak connection, it is possible for this object to deallocate. And therefore, when you run your code, you suddenly got a crash, because the thing it was referencing 
is gone, but you needed that for memory management. So that's where unowned references are a cool addition that can help sort that out. So if I unreference an instance of my class, there is no deallocation because I have an unowned reference from my model, and that's going to behave like a strong association. But if I unreference both sides, a strong and unowned reference, unlike a strong, is not powerful enough now to keep those both alive. So what will actually occur is they will both deallocate and they will both be destroyed, therefore making it safe for your apps to run using those references. Now, when you're writing them in code, there's a very quick little example. You just prefix your properties with weak or unowned, and strong references are the assumed norm. And as you can see, a strong reference can be set as a let, but a weak must be a variable because it has to be able to mutate throughout the lifespan between nil, and also all weak references must be an optional. Okay, so now that's not everything. You are not now Swift experts, but that is just to give you a quick idea of the language. And um, what we're going to do at Academy classes later on there, we're going to run a three-day um, introduction to Swift course. That will cover all of that in more detail with you writing a lot of code and examples and things. And then also as well showing how you can make Swift coexist with Objective-C and all going into the more complex ideas like generics and tuples and lots of other things. Okay, So that's just really a taster of some of what's in Swift. But it's all very easy to get out there and learn if you've got the time because there's those videos from Apple. And I would recommend watching the three of those. Each one's an hour long and within three hours they'll cover more or less the whole lexicology of the language. So it's a fairly good thing to sort of look through and play around with. Now, in terms of what we've got inside of Xcode itself, some new things, we've got these new, and here's a little coded example already, and this is a live view. Can you see that? And these little user interface, I have to confess here, Apple does a really lovely demo, and they build more or less exactly that. When I saw the demo, I thought, I'm going to think of a lovely thing to make myself, which will demo this. And after thinking for about an hour, I thought, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to use Apple's idea because it's such a neat idea at showing this. And if I select each of these, which are in a static table, you'll see I can even, inside of the properties here, give objects. Whoop, can you see that? So I can actually, if I want to, change the color of this to be a different color. And also, as well, I can change all the values, like change the width, change the actual setting. Can you see? So rather coolly, without having to write, and I'm sure you've done this loads of times, code that then is to set up statically designed values and things because you can't do it in the storyboard. Now you can using these news live views, which is rather cool. So let me just give you a little example of how that's all done and put together and a few new features. So if you want to, you've got playgrounds, and I'm not really going to do a tremendous amount with them, but I do have a very quick one that I just set up uh, with not a lot in it. And as you can see with the playground, it just allows you to code, put in some values as you wish and at the right hand side it immediately gives you um, a little overview of what's happening and if you press this little button it opens the assistant view whereby you can actually get access to like a live rendering of graphs and things showing you values mutating over time and showing you as well any animation or drawing code that you might be writing which is quite cool. So the idea is you open a playground, muck around, see your code works and when you're ready copy and paste it back into your classes and move it over into your class files. Um, inside of Xcode itself, I'm just going to make a very new, quick little project. And I'll use a single view application. And you may notice that we no longer have empty application. That's gone. A bit sad about that because I like that one myself. And I'm just going to call this live, um, let's say live views demo. And you can see, by the way, that I'm using Swift as opposed to Objective-C. And I'm making it as a universal app. And now that I've done that, if I show you something you'll be familiar with, if we have a quick look inside of the app delegate, I'm sure even if you hadn't had an overview of Swift, you could probably find your way around that. Would you agree? It's all of what you know and love as you would know and love it. And if you look inside of the view controller, again, you can see there pretty much the same what you already know from that view controller. Now, if I open up the storyboard, this is not familiar. <laughs> this is the new universal storyboard. Now the storyboard in itself is actually quite interesting and that is it's got a number of possible ways it can display itself. Now I'm just going to full screen this and hide the side panel here. 
and just have show you a few little things about how this works. So I'm going to put a label on here, and I'm going to say this label is going to be for all devices. And one of the things you can do is I can open up an assistant view, and instead of looking at code, I can say, could you show me a preview, please, of my storyboard? And in here, I can add all of the differing Apple devices, which this list I'm sure will be a bit fuller by the time you get your finished copy of Xcode 6. But I could put this in and I could put an iPad in, like so. And of course I can use it to see the landscape and the portrait versions. And you can sort of zoom in and out. And it is quite important to have that preview open while you're working because um, the, the generic overview is not really giving you a sized reference as to what you've got. But what I can do in this, which is rather neat, is I'll just switch off that assistant and open and close it. So I did this, and you'll notice at the very bottom here, it has this new value, any, any. Can you see that? And what that's actually marking is the fact that this is for any device. Now, if I change this display, you'll see you've got this sort of rather mad-looking grid inside, and this is any, any in the middle. And as I start changing the size of this grid, you'll see at the very bottom here, it's telling you what devices will be targeted by these sizes. So if I go into this size, it says this is for iPhones in portrait. So if I make anything when it's sized like this, it will only exist on portrait iPhones. And if I make any changes in this view, it will only affect portrait iPhones. You can even rip out all the pins and replace them with alternate constraints, if you wish. So there we are. So now you can see all devices are still there. And if I drag a label in here and say this label is going to say iPhone portrait, You'll see that that's added it like so. And if I come into these views here, and I come into this view here, then again you can see it says this view here is for iPhones in landscape. So if I go to this view, you'll see that already my text has disappeared. And if I drag and add a label in this view, you can see landscape iPhone. That's added that in like there. And if I come up to here and I put it into this view, you'll see this one is for iPads in portrait or landscape. So if I'm working in this view and say this is iPads, then that will only be on iPad designs. And so if I open up my assistant and have a little look at my previews, sure enough, as you can see, iPads has all devices and iPads. Can you see that? And that would be in portrait or landscape. And over here, that's in portrait. And if I send it to landscape, that's now in landscape. So the idea is that this generic layout system means one storyboard can move throughout. But if sometimes it, it, I find sometimes it's a bit more complex than having two separate storyboards if you have a very different UI between the two devices. So it's not that you have to use this, it's just an option. And in fact, if you'd rather go back to the way you know and love it, if you open up file boxes, you'll see size classes is an uncheckable option, and should you do that, it will revert back to an iPhone storyboard or an iPad storyboard. And in fact, if you make an iPad storyboard, it defaults to iPhone or iPad, and you have to come here and turn this on if you want to use the new size classes. Now, the other thing as well with that is all your constraints and things are there. If you make an object, like say I come back to any any, and I make an object here, and I suddenly decide and I'm going to call this any oops. I suddenly decide that actually I didn't want that to be on the iPad. Then if I go over to the iPad view, which is down here, you'll see there's any oops. I'm going, I don't want that. Then, and by the way, did you see how I moved that? If I had constraints and I said update my constraints, then that would register that update only on this view. But here, if I go over to this, you'll see there is, um, if I come over to properties, and look at the very bottom, you'll see there's this new value called installed. Can you see that? And that's telling me that this thing is installed in every layout. But if I come to add, I can add the current layout, regular, regular, and now I can say uninstall. So now this is no longer going to be on the iPad version, and you'll find many things you work with, like constraints and objects, can be uninstalled on various things or reinstated. And in fact, if I was to go to um, the iPhone version and pick up iPhone Portrait, you'd see there at the very bottom, it's automatically, can you see? Set up the installments. And if I wanted to, that would reintroduce it to all the other user interfaces. Does that make sense?
Cool. Now, I just had a little man pop his head through the door with a big sign that said five minutes, which is a bit annoying. Um, so what I'm going to do is I was going to sit and actually code from scratch and talk you through some other things. But fortunately, I have an oven with a pre-made one, uh, which actually you just saw before. So I'll just get that one out and said and just show you a quick glance at what the code looks like if you'd like to do one of those things. But I was going to talk through a bit other things about that because um, I was going to show you a few bits and pieces about when you put the code in itself and setting up as well the constraints. And by the way, when you're setting up constraints, um, you could do this in the older version, but not that many people did. You can still use all the pin devices down here, but don't forget, if you select an object and control drag to a view, you get all of the pinning options come up here, and with the shift key, you can set several constraints at once. And it's a much quicker way of working than using the pinning machine at the very bottom, uh, which is quite sort of neat. And if you press Control and Shift on any view, and this isn't new, but it's a thing that not many people know about, you get a list of all the views underneath. So that's just Control and Shift, because I bet a lot of you have been spending years opening this guy and drilling into that, whereas actually just Control and Shift will give you a little list to select all your views. Now, with this setup here, let me just very quickly show you the code for this. And um, again, I was going to talk you through it, but seeing as it is sort of a rip-off of an Apple demo anyway, if you watch the Apple lecture of what's new in Interface Builder, you'll get this sort of thing showing up like so. And what you can see is, if you are going to make your own views draw in real time, the one condition is you have to build your very own framework. And that sounds like that's going to be a lot of hard work, but it is actually very simple. If I open up that little project again, here, then all I would do is, if I return to my settings, and come up here and use the option add targets. Can you see that? I would just say I'm going to build a framework like so and give it something like live view demo kit or something like that, whatever you want to call it. And now that I've done it, that's all you have to do because everybody thinks, oh, I've got to make a framework and they get excited. That's it. Job done. And now all it means is when I build my instance of UI view, in order to get it to run, when I make it and say live view or from a UI view, I would say instead it's going to be targeted on my framework. Does that make sense? And that's it. That's the only technical thing you have to really do to make that work. So if you can deal with those two simple stages, that's there. And then the other thing that you need to do is in your class is declare that it is at interface builder designable. Can you see? And this can also be done in Objective-C as well. There's an Objective-C prefix that's there. And if you prefix any of your properties with at IB inspectable, that means automatically when you are looking at the storyboard, when you select the object, those properties will be wired up to user interface. So you can then set those properties in your user interface. And the only thing that you might wish to do when you are then looking at the code for that, i just come back to the view here, is to then put some observers on there. Can you see that? So what they're just saying is, if in the storyboard you change any of the values, run a little method that will update the drawing of your object. And as you come down here, you'll see there's the little method. I'm just running the method layout subviews. And in here, I'm just checking. And another little thing is, I've declared these optionals is actually automatically unwrapped. And what that means is, although they're optionals, they will always have a value in because in initialization, a value will be set. So that means when I'm working on it, I don't need to test them. But if I didn't set those values in in it, then what would happen is my program wouldn't compile. So if you do use an optional, you can declare they are force unwrapped, and then that saves you having to test them on the rare occasions when you want optionals that actually are always set. So then as I go through here, you'll see I'm just writing the normal code, and I'm just making um, some core animation shapes, I'm using some affine transformations on those to make those shapes a bit smaller. And I'm just adding those onto the view. And if I was doing that with you, that looks like a lot, but you know how Xcode works. So loads of code appears in seconds. Then as you put that all together, then literally as I'm coding, every time I do one thing, something happens. And just to sort of demonstrate that to you, if I open up the storyboard and I come to the split view here and I just tell it to look at my class, which is my live view file, like so. If I just did something in this, like I said, for example, um, let's take the transformation of the, let's say, let's take the transformation of the background of that. If I do that like so and take that off, then what you would see is the second I save it, can you see that? I've got an immediate update, and if I took that transformation off my foreground, 
like so. If I just did that and save, then you'd see again immediately an update in your drawing code a few seconds later after you do it. And I'm sure that's a lot better than build and see, build and see, which is of course the way you have to do it at the moment. So I promise this to be quite cool and interesting, I think. So hopefully that's given you an idea of some of the changes and what's new, and also as well introduce you to slightly the scope of Swift and what's happening in Swift. Okay. Anyway, um, any questions quickly? How long did it take you to get your head around Swift? Um, I'm still doing it um, in certain ways. Um, I found it was really quick because if you watch those Apple lectures and they're much better than the book, read, watch the lectures, they are much better. You'll take about three hours to get your head around it and then they really do set you up in a much better way than what the book does because the book is very hypothetical whereas that demo is actually really good because the engineers are actually the engineers who made it all and then they demo it in a way which is very hands-on and practical and so if you want the quickest way I just watch that in three hours you'll be fairly rounded and then there'll be skids and disasters all the way until about the usual three month line and then you'll be fine with it because I still even this day and age forget to cast things and get errors and stuff like that yeah so I came late um, yeah have you done much objective C which is your background Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've used Objective C since OS X first came out, and it's always been one of my favourite languages. So I was in a veil on a cliff, weeping and throwing a hanky over the edge um, because I was very sad to see it go. Um, but I do think Swift is a more modern platform to work with, and when you get used to it, and it will, there will be a lot of hate before there's a lot of love. Because you'll sit there and it'll be like, you know, you know all the funny things of Objective-C and everything you do, you can get exactly what you want. Whereas you'll try to do the simplest thing in Swift and there'll be red things everywhere and there'll be a lot of swearing and cursing. And then eventually you'll get to the stage whereby you can actually do it without too many issues. And if you think about it, you have the same run-in period with Objective-C, just that because you're over that now, you can get things done quicker. But the thing with Swift is it really does promise less code and a more modern implementation and also lots of pitfalls of Objective-C are gone now and so um, once you get your hand, hand around, head around a few of those basics and that video from Apple is the best way to do it or come see me and I'll teach you over three days the same thing then I would say that really is you know it's not too difficult to get your head around and just give yourself a good month or two to get to practice it and then bear in mind you'll hate it for the first week like anything new everybody hates everything new and then once you got used to it you love it after that okay yeah it's, um um, I know not, I'm afraid, offhand without looking up what, what was what's happening with that at all, but um, it's it's got already its own sort of unit testing frameworks and things built into Swift, um, and the same with that Objective-C has, but, what, but all the third-party stuff that's floating around, you'll have to wait and see what's happening, because of course, anything that requires people's effort, it's, not, it's usually people put it off, and that's true with frameworks. But of course, there's no harm, because frameworks, the beautiful thing about it is you can literally merge Swift and Objective-C together and there is no issues at all. You can call Objective-C methods from Swift and you can call Swift methods from Objective-C. And if you want to, if you've got a class in Swift and you need to do some Objective-Cs, you just add a header and an implementation that references the Swift file. And likewise, if you want to extend an Objective-C class in Swift, you can reference the Swift class through the Objective-C class and then just write your code in Swift. And Apple has, again, a lecture on, um, I forget what it's called, but it's something like integrating Objective-C in Swift. So if you watch that lecture, it's another hour, so four hours if you want to yeah, get the biz. Like the idea of yeah. having to go back and redo mm. all your old apps. Absolutely. And so, um, but what I would say in the future is if transitions are anything to go by past experience, then there could be a cutoff point in the future where they'll say, oh, guess what, just to spring it on you, Objective-C isn't going to work from next week, so could you please record all your apps? And that's what's happened in the past. You've had like a three or four year transition period. And then if you remember from going to Carbon, the core call, there was that phase where they said, right, if your apps aren't in core call, it's not going to run anymore. And I'm imagining there'll be a similar thing with this. But the nice thing about it is they're so similar in certain ways that they're very easy to modernize. And if you've got one of those dual classes, then just like you would be in a shed pottering away at the weekend with plants and things, you could just be swifting your existing code and, you know, do it one method at a time. You know, and therefore it should be you know, relatively painless to modernize and move over from that. Any other questions? All right, well, in which case then, um, I hope you found that useful and interesting. And that's just to give you a few ideas of what's coming. And, you know, good luck with it. Cheers. Watch the Apple videos. And if you need more help than that, we'll do that three-day Swift course. I don't know what the dates are of hand because it's still being organized. But um, we're going to regularly. And all of our standard iOS courses for beginners and for developers, which assume you don't know how to do iOS, will be based on Swift. 
after that point, although for the first six months we're going to give the students the options to choose Objective-C or Swift, but the bias will probably be towards Swift, and then once we get beyond Christmas, it will be compulsory that those courses will be run in Swift. Okay. And then what we'll be doing is we'll be funnily enough running Objective-C sideline courses because some people will need Objective-C to maintain existing apps. So we're going to run Objective-C apps, Swift apps, Sw uh, Objective-C development and Swift development as two separate courses, and then the native iOS will be purely Swift-based from December onwards. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you, guys.